Hey, welcome back to Player Base. I'm GR, and today we are continuing our deep dive into the 1D and D player test feedback. And having gone through the human section, now we are going to look at the alternative celestial racial option, which is uh, I forget what they call it, but it's uh, this Kometo Vedic with a touch of Chinese zodiac uh, animal head icon choice that they have, which is in good spirit, but really kind of misplaced in terms of their application. You know, the whole idea of this, again, it's, there's a couple of issues, right? One is they want to make the game more accessible to people and they want people who don't feel included or involved to feel more included and involved. And I think that that's a very, not only because of it's, necessary for, it's necessary for their market share, but because it's just a good thing to do in general. It's a great move, but the application is a little misguided. You know, I've lived in Seattle myself, so I understand the uh, bias here, but if you want people, particularly people who don't look like this, to feel more included in the game, the answer is to not give them more Island of Dr. Moreau furry options, because the actual proportion of gamers who are furries actually much smaller than you would think if you didn't live in downtown Seattle. And, you know, the reason for why that's a big deal in Seattle is a whole other issue. It's funny, but it's off topic. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that furries feel included in the game, but they already have plenty of options. <laughs> you know, something like 40% of the racial options in the main or in the variant uh, rule books that they gave for 5th edition were, you know, some kind of bird person or a cat person or, a, you know, horse or all that kind of stuff. And, you know, outside of Samhain, which is a fancy word for Halloween, themed Hanna-Barbera one-shots, most people who are playing as like, you know, Legolas or Harry Potter or Blade are not super keen to play in a party with a talking dog. And, you know, one of the reasons that so much of the material that they present is focused on places like Waterdeep or Sigil or Planescape is because it's a nexus of different worlds where there's a reasonably plausible explanation for why, like Blade and Jon Snow and Legolas, would be hanging out together doing what's essentially, you know, a high fantasy equivalent of a FedEx job. And in some of those instances, having like a talking dog or a bunch of bird people makes sense, or even an orc, you know, but not everywhere. And more importantly, they don't give you the framework to contextualize those types of options with one another. And I was showing this to my bro, and he was emphasizing that it sounded like I was ragging on personas. And so I'm going to emphasize this. I think what would be great would be a supplemental material that explains the entire sort of basic phenomenology of a My Little Pony style campaign or, you know, the realm of Dr. Moreau or what have you, right? And more importantly, so that those people feel included with other people at the table or other types of games, is the framework to explain why, like, a, you know, a bear with a rainbow on its chest would be in a party of, you know, pseudo-Tolkienian fantasy races killing 10 rats in a basement, in a bar, right? Because you don't have that. You know, the rest of that stuff is all within dialogue of itself to some degree or another. It's all in, um, you know, like Colville says, it's in fantasy land. People kind of understand where Jon Snow and Legolas would intersect. They, they have a frame of reference for that. Like, but they don't for Scooby-Doo. And if you don't give it to them, it just becomes overly silly. And have, silliness is great, but you need to have people engaged in the game. And this is important. We're going to talk about the fourth wall and, uh, like, French critical theory. <laughs> so, 
Jean Baudrillard wrote Simulacrum, I think in the early 80s. Uh, speaking of talking animals, he references Disneyland. So a simulacrum is a copy of which there is no original. And he's kind of in dialogue with uh, Walter Benjamin, who at the beginning of the century wrote The Reproduction of the Moving Image, where Benjamin says because of, you know, trains go fast now and you can get places quicker and you can, like, print out a version of, say, like the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa loses value and meaning because just anybody could have it and the experience of being around it and, and witnessing it is dissipated. And, you know, he makes a good point because now, you know, you, to see the Mona Lisa, you got to wait in a line that's like an hour long and it's behind bulletproof glass and people throw pies at it. Like, that's not... Incidentally, if, if you wonder what the thing about the Mona Lisa is, the head basically cuts off at the top and the two sceneries on either side of it are such that when you look at it, it creates an optical illusion so that, like it smiles if you actually look at it. It was a real masterpiece of perspective and understanding the mechanics of the way the human eye works by da Vinci. That's the big deal about that. It's, a, it's an optical illusion like a magic eye book. That's what it's about. And it was built back in the day when you couldn't print out like hundreds of thousands of copies of magical eye books or have computers to present images of static that if you looked at them the right way, like a three-dimensional boat came out. But back to the point with Baudrillard, who says, a copy of which there is no original. And the example he gives is Disneyland. Because if you look at it, Disneyland at the corner of your eye, it looks like a medieval European castle kingdom. But any amount of actually paying attention to it, you know, it kind of looks like Mont Saint-Michel in France and kind of looks like something in Prague, but not really. Like any amount of attention to it, like it, it, it's not related to anything. And incidentally, he says, the purpose of Disneyland, which people say is fake, Disneyland isn't fake. Disneyland is Disneyland. The purpose of Disneyland is to make Los Angeles look real by comparison. And Dungeons and Dragons is a simulacrum. It's not an accurate representation of Tolkien or of Jack Vance or of Robert E. Howard or Lovecraft or any of the other pastiches that it's put together. It's a pastiche of a pastiche of a pastiche of a pastiche. And it's its own thing in that it is kind of like these things, but not really. It's got its own thing going on because of that. And that means that the references that you have for it don't directly apply, but they're workable enough that you can interact with it and feel like you're speaking the same language. And that's why you can have some of the pastiche from, you know, George R. R. Martin, some of it from Robert Howard, some of it from Lovecraft, and it kind of works together because it's not really any of those things. But all that stuff is in a kind of constellation with itself, and then all the animal stuff is like way over here, and they've built no highways between them. And the reason Dungeons and & Dragons and role-playing games are engaging is because, and the reason the rule set is important is because the rule set is your suspension of disbelief. That's what I was touching on in the last video when talking about what the rule set is and what the game is. The rules are there to give you a sense of haptic feedback of a real world. And the Dungeon Master is playing a different game from the PCs because the Dungeon Master's game and their job is to create the phenomenology that makes that world feel real when you poke it. And the reason the rules are important in D&D is because an understanding of them and an understanding of their symmetry within the rules themselves is what allows players' psyches to become engaged with the game emotionally. Oh, hey, sorry, uh, I forgot that I had Blink as a ritual cast, and um, I uh, sneezed. My bad. What am... Ah! Oh, man. Jack Vance strikes again. So... Like I was saying, the issue with the rules is that the reason the rules need to be internally consistent isn't because the game is meant to be fair or that the players are meant to have an equivalent amount of power. The reason is because the rules being internally consistent are the vehicle by which players are able to engage with their psyche and their emotions into the game. The rules are the construction of the fourth wall. And 
when people are emotionally invested in the game, when people feel that they are interacting with a real world that has feedback, they will believe it, whether they believe it or not. That's why the enshrinement, the protection of the fourth wall is so important in a game like this. It's also why fourth wall breaking jokes uh, are easy and cheap and very often over a long period of time detrimental to the play. Also, it's much harder to do in wall jokes. Uh, you know who does it really well is, of course, Penny Arcade, particularly the C team. Very, very funny show, but the, even when the jokes are so funny that they break the fourth wall, the jokes are within the context of the game itself. And the, the result of that is that both the players and the audience believe and invest in the emotional and psychic interplay within the game. And that's important. And so, to round out this bit with... Um, people who really want to play as talking animals, that type of narrative is so left of center of the rest of the agreed upon simulacrum that without providing the framework or the structure to connect it to the rest of fantasy land, it breaks the fourth wall and people just are not that enthused. It would, I mean, I actually don't know the exact answer to this problem. I can't give you one because I haven't thought about it and quite frankly, because I don't like running games like that, and one of the reasons is this. It, it's a very interesting problem to solve, but this is not it. You know, this uh, Egyptian pantheon, which is kind of like a slightly Hindu pantheon, is, but like from the island of misfit deities, this is not going to cut it. Especially because with the, the offers they have don't really line up, you know, in terms of the virtues that they want to present in several ways. Um, and, you know, it's not really, the powers here are kind of lackluster, and that's important because if you want someone to be the avatar or the projection of a, a beatific deity, of a godly force, you got to make them feel like it. And you can't be niggling about, about like, oh, whether well, maybe they have too much strength at level one. Like, if your players are steamrolling, the enemies that you're giving them, the answer is not to change the rules. The answer is to give them more and harder enemies. You know, if you have a, a, a group, and this, is, this doesn't go, only go for Dungeon Masters, this goes for, like, you know, the material presented. This needs to be in, like, as a little footnote. Like, if you've got a party of four that show up, and the six goblins that you have in the, you know, in, in the prepared material are not going to cut it, make them 12. Make them 24. Make them... Make them hobgoblins. Make them ogres, right? You know, if you have one character who is way stronger, even at the same level than the other ones, then, you know, by a miraculous number of coincidences, make it so that you have twice as many enemies and half of them are always fighting that one person so that they feel like they have something to do. The answer is not to give your enemies more hit points. That is punitive. Nobody wants to sit there looking at their chart going, okay, well, it's round five of combat uh, is bloodied. Okay, I used all my spells. I mean, using the character's resources when they have resources is important so that they feel like it's, you know, a limited, if it's, it's expendable, like their spell slots or their healing potions or whatever, whatever MacGuffins they have on their sheet. But more than three rounds of combat and you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Like, unless it's the big bad guy at the end, or it's a dragon or something, that's not, you just, you, nobody wants to fight a sponge. You know what I mean? Like, have your enemies be more dangerous. Have them be harder to hit. Have them be more deadly. But, like, don't just give them loads of defense. And AC isn't meant to indicate toughness necessarily, which is why, like, if you're just really agile, you have a higher AC. But... That's a trap that everyone falls into. Just like hit points, we, 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 we take it to mean health. Even in the, the official rule book, it has stuff like that. So watch out for that um, in design, both as a dungeon master and as a game designer, and also as a player. Watch out for this kind of approach, right? Um, you want the players to feel like, you know who does this really well? Pendragon. 
Whoa, Pendragon. It's not, this is maybe the first, but not the last time I'll mention them in this deep dive. Because in Pendragon, like, it, someone's dead within three rounds, right? You, everyone has the same four weapons, and it's called shots. And it has this um, really wonderful mechanic that when you hit somebody with a sword in the neck, like, Bushido Blade, blood comes out and they fall down. And that's it. And, you know, it's not like G.I. Joe, where they're just crawling out of the pit <laughs> that they got thrown into after they got blasted with a laser. No, no, that's it. They're gone. And that has the wonderful effect of people going, oh, ah, okay, what do I do? And then they just, they, they grab whatever's near them. That's also why there aren't that many weapons or powers in Pendragon. You know, like every time a character is looking at their, just, just staring at their character sheet, that's a failure state, right? They're not emotionally engaged. They're looking for like which key on their keychain fits this lock that you gave them. Like that's, that, doesn't in, that doesn't engage the believability of the world. But back to this issue with regards to the characters that they've given you. You know, they, because the demon human characters, the tieflings, which are very popular and I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, um, they have this very distinctly Abrahamic, Christian in particular, uh, set of like hell references. They want to give a non-Western counterpart, but this is not it for a couple of reasons. One is hell doesn't work the same way in non-Abrahamic religions. And in fact, it doesn't really work in Islam and in Judaism the way that it does in most versions of Christianity. And they're not exactly congruous in the same way. And, you know, the boundaries are a bit more malleable depending upon, I mean, in this case, you're talking about Kemetic, which is to say Egyptian pantheons or what has like some kind of animal head or in um, Hinduism and in most variants of Buddhism, the realms, they're, they don't work in the same way. Um, and even in Western European non-Christian theologies, like in, um, you know, traditional like Scandinavian concept of the afterlife or, you know, the Celtic concept of the barrier between the physical and the non-physical world or the Mediterranean one in the Greek or the Roman or the Scythian or the Anatolian or the Levantine. It doesn't work like this. And every single noun that they have for hell in D&D &D is ripped right out of a Presbyterian minister's Sunday sermon at a Glasgow workhouse for unwed mothers in 1964. Excuse me, 1864. Like, you've got all of this, like, super Protestant fire and brimstone, like Gehenna, um, Abraxas, all that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, if you're not going to have angels for that, okay, but, like, don't put this in its stead, right? This doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And if you want to include people who are not from like Western Judeo-Christian backgrounds, again, this is a mismatch for that. And also, these aren't very exciting. Like no one wants to be rat person or Zelda orc, but with extra steps, right? Like he has a pig's head. Guys, like if, you're, if this is a reference to like the legend of the monkey king, um, you know, the pig-headed bodyguard is like not a person, like that person is like someone who was like in heaven, but a corrupt uh, official, you know, they weren't, you know, they, it wasn't an expression of a virtue, right? Um, Arthur Whaley's translation of The Legend of the Monkey King uh, is a great thing to read, uh, especially if you like Dragon Ball, because that's where all that stuff comes from. And if you didn't know that, the, the original Dragon Ball from the 80s is just a retelling of the central myth of East Asian Buddhism, which is Mahayana Buddhism, where this guy, Tripitaka, goes, which is what Krillin is meant to represent, goes into a big journey from, from China into India to pick up the, um, the sutras, which are like, they're not exactly scriptures, it's more like a workbook on how to do something, uh, an explanation, a treatise. Um, and you know, he's accompanied by these different characters, and one of them is the king of all monkeys, who it was born out of like this rock, uh, which was hit by lightning and then stole like a peach of immortality. And that's, Sun Goku actually means, it's, it's from Sun Wuhong. It's the, most of you know that if you knew what I was talking about already, but like, man, it's a great story. Um, and, like, and here's the thing, like going back to the previous episode, 
like a just a legend of the monkey king story campaign booklet would sell like gangbusters with loads of people who are not even necessarily you know han chinese or um or korean or japanese like because i mean i don't know if you know this like if if some if by some miracle someone watches this watching this like <laughs> African American pop culture community is heavily invested in Dragon Ball, and if you put out uh, like source material, because you already have like the Dragon Ball like monk character, if you put out like a Legend of the Monkey King campaign booklet, that would do really well to get your like demographics of people of color into the game. Just a thought. So, uh, like in conclusion, if you want to have animals in the game, great. But don't have animal people in the game uh, to give a vehicle for people who aren't white. Because that's what it, like, from what I've seen, like, that's what a lot of this stuff is about. Like, first of all, that's low-key insulting. And second of all, it's not that hard to just, you know, I mean, 5th edition material, uh, to some degree 4th edition, but 5th edition material was better at having sort of a general inclusion in terms of, of you know, the different types of ethnicities that would be presented in the human and humanoid races. But, like, it wasn't out front enough. And, like, having, like, a big, strong, like, fighter be a black dude with dreads is cool, you know? Like, hey, I know you're from Seattle. I love Marshawn Lynch, too. He's a great guy. But, like have some black elves, like have a whole thing about that, right? Not dark elves, not drow, um, but like black elves. Have something where you have East Asian elves. Have something where there's like explicit material that touches on that stuff. Because, you know, I mean, many of you know this, the first couple of editions of Dungeons and Dragons had a really long and extensive weapon list mostly just pole arms, like different types of glaives that had minute distinctions to them in terms of how you would use them in a dungeon running capacity because they're field weapons for, uh, you know, Renaissance European warfare. So, you know, if you want to do something medieval and European, you have the tools that's to do that historically. But, like, if you want to use, like, a Chinese straight sword, is that a short sword? Is that a long sword? Is that a rapier? None of them really quite fit, and I know that very well because I have endeavored to put Chinese straight swords in at least three editions of the game. Like, really worried the details on that. And this, right, if you want to have non-Judeo-Christian pantheons in the, in the racial classes, this isn't it. And also having it be diametrically opposed to the obviously like Christian held demon people is, that's not going to cut it either. Especially because the demon people, people respond to that, and I'll talk to that, for reasons that have nothing to do with this other stuff. So, I mean, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you don't like it, comment and subscribe so you can hate watch and tell me how much you hate it. Share this with your friends. Share this with your enemies. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I am GR. Uh, thank you for watching another uh, episode of Player Based as we go through this deep dive of the 1D&D &D playtest material.